Hey guys, Peter Steel here, back with another video. And July has come and gone, that means August. New Dev Diary, and oh boy, this is a massive one. Today we will be taking a look at the new Soviet Union historical and common branches for the focus tree. And oh my god, is it spicy so spicy now of course everything you will be seeing here is work in progress values art none of that is final and anything can and might change now let's start right off here with good old Josef Stalin as you can see here a few things have changed not only does the man have a first name now but he also has traits and throughout the game and the focus tree he has the opportunity to pick up many many more traits but more on that later Later, a few things about the country itself have also changed, obviously, such as your initial war support, because they want to make it harder for you to get war economies super early. Eh, I guess it makes sense. Soviet Union is powerful enough without it, and it's not very realistic. Not only that, but national spirits. There are many of them, and apparently they're only willing to show us the first two right off. But we might get a look at the others later. Starting off with the home of the revolution, crank raid factions, ideology drift defense. Eh, not that amazing. Factions are nice. And the Trotskyite plot, this one has been there before, but I think they changed it a little bit so you also get some political power gain penalties. Next up, some of your starting advisors. The head of the NKVD now has a special slot where you cannot actually replace him until you've done the Great Purge. Start off with Genrik Yagoda, who you can then purge and replace with Nikolai Yezov, who you can then also purge and replace with Lavrenti Beria. Yes, we all know and love Beria. Not only that, but the actual roster is much expanded and availability will depend on your choices in The Purge as per usual, but you have many more options this time. And it's nice because Soviets were kind of limited early on. Now they do promise an even longer list of advisors for the alt history branches, so they aren't showing those yet, but I am very interested. But apparently most of them will be purged. Ooh, ooh. Moving on with some changes to the generals. Now start out with the five historical field marshals of the Soviet Union. Uh, and if I memory serves me, um, all except Tukhachevsky and Voroshilov will get purged if, if you go the historical route. And they're also redoing several portraits apparently because the the ones they've been using so far were from after the war uh, it's, it's nice that they put in the effort but now on to the meat and potatoes of this let's open up this picture oh yeah yes this is a big boy this is the new focus tree for the Soviet Union and this this black thing here that they've got um, well hidden this is probably the alt history communism branch probably trotskyite considering it's under the um communist icon you can also see it's mutually exclusive with a path they aren't showing yet probably also alt history and hopefully monarchist because i like me some monarchism anyway that's very nice uh but let's let's break it up into a few smaller easier to digest branches starting off with the industry soviets being soviets it's going to be very very focused on the five-year plans you will work your way through them and try to make the soviet union uh, into something else than an, uh, an agrarian state you want to um heavily industrialize your country. You will start with a national spirit representing the second five-year plan, the one in full swing at the start of the game, and as a result, you will get yourself a couple of penalties resulting from the harsh collectivization and the major advances in industry and infrastructure. But because, well, you're industrializing too quickly, you don't have the qualified personnel to actually do it safely. As a result, accidents and low efficiency. Uh, so as you progress through the five-year plans, you get separate bonuses and uh, you kind of improve your country along the way. There's also a special one, the third five-year plan, so the, the, the second one you can pick as a player, I suppose, where you will have to um, decide in which direction you take it as you start your five-year plan or pretty much are halfway into it. I can't remember the exact dates, doesn't really matter, but it's to represent the threat the Soviet Union sees in Nazi Germany and responding to it industrially. And since it was historically somewhat ruined, this third five-year plan, they want to represent that as well in Hoi by being pretty harsh, actually. 
Um, anything below and including the third five year plan, so anything in this red box will become absolutely inaccessible permanently once the Soviet Union finds itself at war with a major power. So you'll have to decide if you want to get these early or if you are willing to get locked out of these. Pretty important. I've never actually seen a focus become permanently locked. Interesting. Now to offset that at the end of that war, um, if you manage to survive, you will actually get a national spirit automatically through completion of some focuses, again, automatically, and you will get some bonuses to repair and rebuilding, some bonuses to your industry, consumer goods, and also unlocking access to the fourth five-year plan. So the th th third one you can pick just so the branch of that focus tree isn't completely locked, but it is essentially locked behind that major war, which is historical, but can also provide you with some major problems if you find yourself at war early. Because usually in Hearts of Iron, after that big war, the game's over. So y you might end up with an industrial branch that never really gets used and players might just play around that problem. We'll have to see. There is some really good stuff in that tree, but they're not showing all of it. One interesting thing here is the Comic-Con not to be confused with Comic-Con. Um, this is pretty much an organization where um, Soviet puppets can receive aid, both industrially and military, to become somewhat stronger and contribute more to the common turn at the cost of the Soviet Union itself, um, giving up a little bit of its strength. It's like those investment portfolios for Turkey, you know, the ones that keep popping up for you, except this, these are decisions you can click, you decide, and you could just make your puppets a little bit better at the expense of losing some consumer goods for a while. It, it is interesting. I don't know if this is actually going to be useful, but it's a nice flavor they're adding. It's also historical, so I like history. Now to the right of the five-year plan focuses, there is also another choice to be made. National specialists or rely on foreign experts. Now, historically, I believe the Soviet Union relied heavily on foreign experts. So foreign companies that consulted with uh, Soviet industrialists and pretty much built the industry for them. Um, and that's going to be represented in an interesting way. You will get a design company called the, I, I can never pronounce this, Gosprojektstroy. Gos anyway, uh, that gives you a lot of bonuses to construction to simulate that outside side help is coming in to help you build stuff, but it will not actually give you a bonus to research to simulate the fact that, oh, this is not your stuff. They're helping you build, but you don't get the know-how. You can uh, choose to bring German and British, Japanese or American experts, which is which is going to be interesting, uh, at a, a varying cost. Uh, none of this is set in stone. Like for instance, here, the, you get a bonus to license production and currently it is set as None, 0.75. So yeah, pretty much all of these numbers are to be ignored. They're just an indication. Next up, the Russian Academy of Sciences, more research slots, and it also gives you more academies in the National Academies of Sciences. Um, How do I put this? You have the big one, the National Academy of Russia, and you get a bunch of, you can build a bunch of subsidiaries in your uh, constituent states of the Comintern, no, not the Comintern, the Soviet Union. Um, for those not in the know, the Soviet Union was a amalgamation of more than just Russia. Also a bunch of Central Asian countries were involved. You had, so the Ukraine was a part, etc. All those different constituent nations, as well as members of the Comintern can have these built buildings built, or rather these academies of science built. And if they are built in your own country, you'll get an extra research, uh, I think a 1% research speed boost for each one. And if you build it in a puppeted republic, so one of your puppets, um, they will also get a research boost. So win-win. Now enough about industry, on to the Air Force. Um, well, it's bigger and it's interesting to, to um, really drive the point home that the Soviet Air Force really wasn't in such a great state. Yeah, you're seeing a lot of red here. You're going to have to deal with this. Fun fact, you, you won't actually be able to get rid of all of it. Throughout this focus tree, you start to, um, you know, undo all of this red text and you will have to make a choice. You will not be able to make all of the penalties disappear. You will have to choose between production of aircraft or training of pilots. So you will pretty much be trading off more airplanes 
or better airplanes. Oh, and fun fact, these women in aviation, that branch, if you follow it through, you can end up with the actual um, women's air force, what do you call them again? Uh, the three all-female aviation regiments for, uh, formed by Marina Raskova, uh, the Air Defense Fighter Squadron, Bomber Regiment, and the Night Bombers, so the Night Witches. That's pretty cool. It's mostly flavor because uh, 120 airplanes aren't really going to make the difference, but they come with aces, so that's, that's nice. And because airplanes are... We are also taking a look at the new and improved Red Fleet. This is something that most Soviet players have and probably will uh, mostly ignore, but they give you the option to go in on Navy. Now, historically, Soviet Navy was not that much to look at. By the late 30s, I believe Stalin got the idea that he wanted his Navy to be more aggressive. So not just coastal offense, but actually to project power outwards. But it never really got off the ground, mostly because, you know, there, there was a thing called the Second World War that happened and his resources were better spent elsewhere. But this allows you the option at the top here, the reinforcement for naval bases will allow you to get, let's scroll on down, certain defensive improvements in the various naval bases. The Western naval bases, I believe, are around Leningrad and the Eastern naval bases are around, what's that place? called Vladivostok. So the major naval bases can actually be reinforced in this way to simulate the historical large buildup of defenses there. Not only that, but much like the French focus tree where you build up your colonies, if you build up these naval bases and reinforce them, you can then expand the shipbuilding plants. And for every one of these ones that you've invested in, you then get an additional dockyard in every state. So if you want to build ships and go Soviet Navy. This really helps you out there. A couple of neat focuses here as well. The PC of the USSR Navy. I have no idea what PC means, but uh, it will allow you to get some uh, nice bonuses to ship repair speed, ship refitting cost, which is actually handy if you use it, right? And it will be further improved by focuses below it based on what choices you make. So you can either go surface warfare, so your screens will become cheaper, or you go with uh, submarines, allowing you to get cruiser submarines and a couple of them will actually be added to your buildings uh, building queue with a little bit of progress already done and cruiser submarines are really good not only that but the soviet navy can get aircraft carriers by getting the project 71 class aircraft carrier as a converted cruiser hull it's it's not much but it's a start so options all around i think this is oh there we go. I think this is a very worthy upgrade to the currently rather lackluster Soviet fleet. And then the big one, the military branch. Look at that. Ooh, ooh, that's big. And it also has some very cool things in it. So let's have a look here. There are really three branches here. One for military industry, one for defense, and one for the army. Military industry all the way to the left will go first. PC of mechanical... Oh, people's committee that's the one that's what that word means all right people's committee of mechanical engineering this will give you multiple research and production bonuses military factories always nice and some tank templates so you, you actually get a couple of them served to you so you, you don't have to do all of the hard work and all of the thinking the su-122 the Su-100, ooh, that's a nice self-propelled gun tank, ooh, it's a tank destroyer. And the T-34, glorious T-34, impenetrable armor. Oh, this one is gonna chew up so many Germans. So that is very nice. And the development of Tankograd, oh, I love that name. So the development of Tankograd will make it cheaper for you to edit tank templates while also building military factories in heavily industrialized states in the Urals and to the east. So this is actually really cool. Um, not just because of the land equipment experience cost. I, I think this is what they, they mean by that, making changes to templates cheaper. But um, they actually allow you to get a free military factory in every state in the Urals and Far East where you already have three military factories. So if you think ahead before you get to this focus, you actually may end up getting a lot of benefit out of this. This can net you a lot of free military factories if you think and plan ahead. And then they we're talking about merging plants. Now, this may sound complicated, but in every one of the army branches, so Navy, Air Force, and, well, Army, there is a focus called 
merge plants, uh, depending on what type of plants we're merging here. This is to simulate how the Soviet Union handled its industry. Uh, factories and, and production sites were often moved and brought under new management or well merged as a, a big plant would take on the production and smaller specialized plants would more work on R&D and building prototypes and delivering reports to the big plants, etc. It's all rather complicated, but it basically boils down to the following. And that is really cool. As you do these focuses, you will have the option to improve certain designers. So whatever designer for land, um, so tanks, aircraft or ships you have, you will have the option of improving them by merging plants. These are decisions. Cost is not set in stone, neither is any of the bonuses, but essentially you will be boosting or buffing your designers this way at a small cost. Again, I don't know what the final cost is going to be, but for a small cost, you will be able to make your designers better. I can only applaud them for putting in the effort. They didn't have to do this. A lot of people, I think almost everyone would have overlooked this or ha would never have even considered this, but the fact that they're willing to go this far for historical accuracy and found an interesting way to implement it in the game that's not terribly micromanagement. This is nice. This is something I really, really like. These are all pretty cool. So you will need to control certain regions. Uh, you will need to have certain designers. So an aircraft designer for this one, uh, ship designers, an active Black Sea ship designer. So it's going to be region locked as well, probably. Uh, you, you're going to have to think ahead and it's going to be difficult to micromanage these, I think. But the flavor is amazing. Speaking of designers, of course, these are some of the designers available. I don't know if this is final, but it's it's a lot better than what they get now. They, they put thought into the icons, the names. The bonuses seem pretty decent. I like this. I like this. Uh, this is the land equipment experience cost. This is probably related to changing your tank templates. Well, not templates, the um, the blueprint. Blue blueprints, that's the one. Then we're talking about the defense branch. Choose between building a defensive line on the border with Poland, called the Stalin line, historical one, or on the border with Germany, your, your new border with Germany, after, you know, walking into eastern Poland, called the Molotov line. I'm not sure if these are mutually exclusive, but uh, we'll see. You'll also be able to fortify Moscow and the White Sea Baltic Canal on the border with Japan. So I'm guessing many, many forts and coastal forts. And then we've also got this one, interesting. Im oh, impregnable forts. This is meant to represent the fearsome coastal batteries around Leningrad and in the Crimea that caused so much trouble to the Germans during the invasion. See, I didn't actually know about that. I didn't know that the Germans had all that much trouble with the with the coastal artillery. It's nice that somebody, you know, picked up a history book and, and read it before they started designing this content. So these just add some nice um, fortifications to key areas, I suppose. I wonder what these modifiers do. These seem uh, historically accurate, like the Krasnaya Gorka battery, the Seraya Lashad battery, and the Armored Battery 35. I'm guessing those will be um, region modifiers, like the Spanish Civil War has the unplanned offensives. I'm guessing this will make it difficult to attack the positions. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Soviets could use all the help they can get defending. And some more bonuses down here. Uh, another research slot, a Soviet atomic bomb project. This is actually really cool. Involves some espionage um, and bonuses for the Soviets to get their own nuclear program by, you know, stealing it from, from others. Now, the world of life is actually pretty cool. Um, it's mostly about uh, Lake Ladoga, which is the lake next to Leningrad, where in summer they um, shipped supplies across uh, with boats and in winter they just drove trucks across the ice to resupply Leningrad as it was besieged. They put in a lot of effort to bring supplies and help to some of the, well, m most hopeless defenses of the Soviet Union. And it's pretty cool that they took that into account. Next up, Army Branch. One everybody, or well, most of you have been waiting for. I see some really, really interesting stuff here, like penal battalions. Yes, please. That is so quintessentially Soviet. Uh, Cossack units might be interesting if you like to use cavalry and the glory of the red army of course let's let's scroll on down so to simulate the fact that the soviet military was highly politicized we'll start off with massive debuffs yay so you'll get a little bit of a bonus to defense on core territory woohoo at the cost of well 
everything being pretty shit. Next up, we have the Red Army itself, which is also pretty shit. So, um, key note here, it looks like the Soviet military really isn't that good. And the entire focus of the tree is to mitigate the disastrous national focuses or national spirits and then try to build up from there. Restore the Cossacks is going to allow you to, well, get Cossack units, which is a historically accurate template, but I, I don't see myself using a 13 combat with cavalry division with motorized artillery and light tanks. This just, like, I appreciate the historical accuracy. I do, but don't expect me to use this. I mean, I don't know what the new meta is going to be or how combat is going to work, but I can tell you right now, I will not be using divisions designed like this. I'm sorry. Now the other option on the branch is cohesion first, boosting your division organization in exchange for a little bit of extra training time. I think this is going to be the one to pick. 5% uh, more orc is glorious and 10% more training time is irrelevant since by the time you go to war, you've got your army. They're trained, they're deployed, and anything you need to deploy after that is either a result of poor planning or is a nice cherry on top you don't really need, but you can pump out the troops anyway. Then there have been some changes to rehabilitated military and military reorganization. <laughs> I'm seeing here Stalin's paranoia. Uh, I look forward to seeing what that means. Essentially, I, I guess these will slowly start to build up your red army again since they're, they're terrible, we've seen the debuffs. And the military reorganization is just gonna be something bitter, a bitter pill to swallow, just to get that cure, because it's gonna add even worse stats until they wear off. I don't know how long it lasts for. Oh man, this national spirit will be removed on completion of the focus military reorganization. 70 days of zero experience gain, division org actively dropping down, army organization regain minus 15%. You better plan ahead when you do this one. And we've got some other options, desperate measures. Ah, this one. Um, this is where a couple of cool decisions are hiding. Staggered retreat. Uh, well, you retreat in an orderly fashion and to simulate that you, you get more defense, you lose less org when moving, but your divisions lose speed when moving. So they're just slower on the defense and are it's more of a fighting retreat than just running from the Germans and more options. I don't know what all of these do. I assume raise factory worker militia is going to have a negative impact on production in the factories in the region in exchange for free troops or manpower and civilian labor in defense of uh, regions is probably going to do something similar where one actively raises a division and the other frees up manpower maybe or, or gives the state a modifier not sure and we lose all those new decisions when we finish the focus lessons of war this one unlocks order 227 also known as not one step back there is no land east of the volga and that is going to unlock other decisions that you need to prepare and carry out some important military offensives like operation migration i assume so it just locks these decisions and you probably get access to new ones and as you get to this point lessons of war you pretty much worked on getting rid of the negative modifiers for the red army and this is where the buffs start taking in you start start getting a lot of extra buffs on top of your army. At least that's what they're telling me. I can't really see it in the focus tree here. Um, I, I'm gonna assume that they're not lying to me, but yeah, it's probably got something to do with the organ. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see. Then they've actually paid some attention to the partisan activity since partisans were a major player in the um, Operation Barbarossa and the entire war on the Eastern Front. Now they, they were a big part of the trouble the Germans had and they will actively work to disrupt enemy supplies, hinder enemy offensives, and uh, they've actually included some historically accurate people to do it. Vasily, Vasily here, Sidor, and Dmitry Medvedev. Wasn't that guy president of Russia at some point? Or was that his dad? I don't know. I remember a Medvedev in charge of Russia at some point. And moving down to focus tree, we can finally decide what to do with the um, political commissars. We can either keep them in position, which will uh, give your army certain buffs in exchange for other debuffs. So if you keep them, your divisions have more org, but they recover the org slower. You get more attack on your core territory. Uh, some ideology drift defense, which I really don't think is that important, and more maximum command power. Uh, the 
mutually exclusive option is to get rid of those um, political commissars and keep them around as advisors instead of actual commanders. So you will get a little less org in your divisions, but you will recover the org quicker. You will gain more manpower, sorry, you will gain more command power daily, but you won't get a higher maximum. Um, your commander abilities will be cheaper to simulate the fact that there is more freedom among your field commanders and your doctrines become cheaper. So both of these have their merits and I'm not the numbers guy, but I think they're both viable. And then finally, they say here, the glory of the red army will make it easier for you to unlock those last doctrines remaining and field more special forces decisions. It will also unlock a Soviet specific improved version of the Blitz tactic as well as a new general, General Ribalko. I have no idea who this is but it's nice of him to be included. Alright so I, I, I guess they're not willing to actually show us the glory of the Red Army focus but uh, I'm interested. Oh I almost skipped over this one. Penal Battalions. These will be specialized divisions that are essentially infantry but a little weaker and a little cheaper. Um, is it, it is so cool that they included these. I, I, I don't know exactly how they will play in the grand scheme of things, but I think they can. you can consider these to be expendable infantry. That's the point of a penal battalion, I guess. And of course, unlocked through the focus called Penal Battalions, obviously. Next up, the Internal Affairs Branch, a common branch of the Communist Paths. Now, I see some things I recognize here, like positive heroism and collectivist propaganda, but there's also some new stuff here, like the Agitprop? Agitprop? Komsomsol? Komsomol? The Patriarch of All Russia. Let's see what we've got here. So this branch is going to introduce you to the new propaganda campaign system, unlocked by the focus expand the Agitprop. Um, so yeah, you'll be able to have propaganda campaigns. They're going to be a decision-driven system, so you'll have to make decisions. Uh, I don't know about the costs, but every campaign you run is going to last for six months, after which it will finish and that slots are gonna be available again. You have to unlock these through focuses, I assume. So this is what you'll be seeing. Like if there's a poster in it, that means a campaign is running. If there's like blue smeared and it's ready to have a poster stuck to it, that means that slot is available and you can use it. And then if it's like dirty and covered with some scratched out and worn out posters, that means it is still locked. So you'll probably have to work your way through the focus tree to unlock more of these slots as well as unlocking more of these specific campaigns and it looks like there are a lot of options and these are really cool posters I think these are all historically accurate as well I've seen uh, several of these online before then onwards to the actual positive heroism and collectivist propaganda choices to be made here uh, essentially mutually exclusive once again positive heroism gets you production and military bonuses and promotes uh, Konyev, Rokossovsky and Zuko off to a field marshal position. On the other hand, the collectivist propaganda will give you bonuses to research, research speed, consumer goods, and production efficiency growth. I think these are both viable, and it's gonna be up to the numbers guys to figure out which is the best one. Uh, I, I think both of these should be good. Though it's nice to have Zukov as an advisor. Hmm. And then all the way down here, Patriarch of All Russia. Again, historically accurate is this will unlock Patriarch Sergei as an advisor. He will boost stability and division recovery rate while also reducing the compliance growth in your lost states, making it more difficult for an occupier to, well, occupy your land. Uh, historically accurate, actually. Um, this is uh, the man who inspired the Russian people to resist. He would bless those who went to the front and he actively worked on restoring relations between the church and the Soviet government. He was eventually elected to be the Patriarch of Moscow and all Russia. Patriarch Sergei. And another common branch, so this one's available to all communist paths, foreign relations very important to the Soviet Union, I suppose. So the goal for this branch is to provide the Soviet player with ways to interact with different parts of the world, from the Western theaters in Poland to Baltic, the Balkans to the Middle East, and of course, Far East. One very important thing to note here is that we really wanted to move away from the mechanic of selling ultimatums to countries by justifying a war goal on them. Thank you, since those came from a time when decisions didn't exist and were really unintuitive. Yeah, they, they were really unintuitive. So there's 
no more ultimatums by justifying. They are now decisions. And you also get a bunch of other decisions to put pressure on countries or seek their help or some cooperation. So it's it's no longer about justifying on the, the tiny Baltics to get them to cave. And within the foreign relations, uh, we'll start with the Eastern Development a sub branch. This is focused on building up your tiny minor allies in Asia. So <laughs> Mongolia and Tanatuva, major players in the war. Basically help them build some factories, help them get some more troops, make them a little bit more efficient and eventually well just just annex Tanatuva really. Next up more choices to be made a policy of collective security or a policy of individual security. Again influenced by history somebody did their homework and um, the collective policy or well, the policy of collective security is the initial path the Soviet Union sought out under Litvinov who was then replaced by Molotov who chose the policy of individual security. Um, How do I put this? Collective security is a hard stance against the fascists. This is the Soviet Union putting his foot down and actively seeking out the allies saying, look, this Germany is going to be trouble. Let's smash him. And on the other hand, you have the policy of individual security where the Soviets go, you know, we might be able to use these Germans. Of course, we all know how that ended up, but it's, uh, this branch pretty much gives you options. And all the way at the bottom, you will get yourselves a couple of war goals against major fascist or democratic nations in Europe. Fun fact, at the end of the policy of collective security, you can form a defensive alliance with France. Oh, France, you did wait. And then in the middle, we have some more um, interesting focuses. I, I recognize most of these, like Baltic security, southern thrust, preemptive invasions of Iran, claims on Bessarabia. I believe most of these were already in the old focus tree, and they've been um, slightly reordered and placed in different positions. Like the Baltic security and Middle East diplomacy will influence countries in their region, and then other focuses will um, force cooperations with certain countries and then there's others who will just send an ultimatum right away. Either way, the goal is the same. Ensure Soviet control of the neighboring regions. So as you can see here, this gives you a bunch of bonuses to relations as well as boosting communism support in the countries. Um, Baltic self-determination. This is uh, activating a set of decisions allowing you to put pressure on the Baltics and claims in the Baltics is a follow-up for that. You can then use what you've already built up to really put the square squeeze on them, get them to join you. Well, be absorbed, really. And then in the Eastern theater, we of course have the chance to either deal with Japan or choose to ignore Japan and not attack each other. The choice is gonna be yours in the end, but I think I might find myself fighting Japan more often now that this is an option. Looks pretty interesting. A uh, fun fact, you will be able to choose your favorite China to send help to. Um, the Gobi Gambit. I think this is Xinjiang, Xinjiang, whatever, the yellow flag there, um, can be your favorite. The two red flags just means that Mao gets all of your love and attention, or you can support the Kuomintang. The big yellow China is obviously the correct choice for your help. This means you pick a favorite out of all the Chinese uh, factions and only the one you chose will get help, your help. It gives them some bonuses. Uh, for licenses, you unlock some decisions to send them equipment and you can send them volunteers. But none of the other factions can receive that support. Just the ones you picked. Except if you pick Xinjiang, the yellow flag, um, you will attempt to develop a symbiotic relations. If I remember correctly, y y you turn them into a puppet. Nice. I mean, free puppet, right? If they refuse, you'll get a war goal. And then in regards to Japan, there will be a couple of options. If you control the Kuril Islands, Sakhalin and Hokkaido, I, I don't remember which Hokkaido is. Isn't that the top island of Japan? I don't know. I think it's that, that really cold bit up there. If you control those, you will be able to demand Japanese submission, um, offering to immediately cease hostilities in exchange for your desired territories. So a bit like the scripted peace event with China. That's pretty cool. And on the other hand, if you want to try and reconcile with the Japanese and not deal with them, you can offer them territorial concessions. You give them North Sakhalin, and hope to develop closer ties with them. Then you can send yourself an ultimatum to Xinjiang and form an offensive pact with Japan Ooh, against the USA. Yo, that's that's actually interesting. That might spice things up for the um, for the player. I like that. I, I do like that. And now the big one, the political branch. Now bear with me. I know, I know. This is a long dev diary. I've been talking for a while. We're almost there. This is a mammoth 
Death Diary. Look at this political branch. The center, Joseph Stalin, has a pretty damn big tree. Well, he is the father of nations, so we'll, we'll allow it. And before we talk about any of the focuses, we need to talk about new mechanics being introduced. Stalin's paranoia. The US has the Senate, the USSR has Stalin, and as he becomes more paranoid, focuses get locked out and you get certain, I believe, negative traits. So certain focuses, decisions and traits will also increase or decrease paranoia. There will be a flat increase that will get mostly via focuses, events and decisions, weekly modifiers that will slowly impact your paranoia over time. And there, those will come from leader and advisor traits that will be applied to Stalin and the NKVD advisors the moment the system is activated. Uh, you can see here, Stalin is paranoid. Stalin's paranoia increases by one weekly. Yagoda here is also gonna increase Stalin's paranoia by one weekly. Yeah, this is probably a good idea. It's historically accurate for one, and it is gonna balance the strength of the Soviet Union. It's gonna make you a little bit weaker just by having a very anxious mustache in charge. Once the system is activated, random perch events might happen if your paranoia gets over 25. Oh boy, the higher the paranoia, and the more days it's been that high, the more likely it is for a purge to happen. If paranoia goes over 75, it is capped at 100, then really nasty things can happen and you might get what I call great purge events instead of regular purge ones. Oh god, Stalin, what are you gonna do? Now there's a lot of different purge events and they can be sorted based on the area they're targeting. The administration, the army, the navy and the air force. Additionally, each area has its own regular and great purge events. Oh, like Regular events are gonna purge a single character, so it could be a political advisor, an, an admiral, a field marshal, a general, or give you some penalties in the form of a national spirit, and the great purges are significantly worse, varying from n nastier national spirits to purging a lot of characters at once while cowing some of the survivors to even dissolving your aircraft designer. Oh boy, oh boy. So yeah, they're showing off a couple of these um, negative modifiers and yeah, I, I, I can see how Stalin's paranoia is gonna be a problem. Good thing that purging will always reduce paranoia, so that's good to know. You can also avoid purging someone or something when a purge event happens, but it will greatly cost you PP and make paranoia increase and you won't be able to avoid the next purge if you're out of PP. Oh, okay. So you'll start with a huge roster of characters uh, for political and military advisors and military leaders and the list is slowly gonna be reduced as more and more people get purged. Uh, and they're all gonna start ending up here. Oh, uh, yeah. I like what they're doing with Stalin's paranoia. Now, how do we get rid of it? Well, that's where the focus tree comes in. The Stalinist tree can be split into two parts. Upper half is before the purges, bottom half after you've removed the paranoia system. First half, that's all of this. Um, I think it pretty much culminates in dealing with Trotsky and his uh, cronies. The focus of the center will grant you some stability, PP, and will add a, a fairly weak national spirit called the Politburo, which will be improved by focuses in this branch, pretty much like it does with every other branch in the tree. Uh, it gets stronger as you move down. The focus featuring a bloodied sickle will target, well, well, sorry, will trigger the historical purges in the form of unavoidable great purge events, such as the Moscow trial and the trial of the generals. Oh boy. So these are the purges we know and love already. Oh, they're gonna have a cooldown requirement to prevent the player from rushing that part of the tree. Oh, a bit lame. But once you get to the bottom, um, the third Moscow trial event will be triggered and the paranoia system will be removed forever. The purges have finally ended. So yeah, yeah, I, I think you want to get down here as quickly as possible. Yeah. Also, several focuses in other branches are going to be locked until you do. So uh, pol politics is probably going to be important. Uh, fun fact, <laughs> you, you, you get the option to take out Trotsky as well by the focus behead the snake. <laughs> so you can either subtly remove him or uh, raid his villa and go, in, go, go in guns blazing. Options, I suppose. Uh, it doesn't completely remove the purges, but it does make the penalties a little less harsh because Stalin can sleep a little bit easier now. Anyway, once the purges are dealt with, you get to the second part of the tree and that's where you 
you start building Stalin's cult of personality. So this entire thing is mostly focused on building up Stalin as your leader. Uh, not only is it going to boost the Politburo a little bit, or well, significantly, um, but it is also going to really improve Stalin as a leader, giving him more and more bonuses. A couple of choices will have to be made. You're either the faithful servant of Lenin or the inheritor of the mantle of Lenin. It's just gonna change what bonuses you get. Not gonna go over all of them since there will be a lot of changes here, but essentially Stalin is going to well, become a Chad among Chads. Look at what this man might eventually become. Of course, these are all work in progress, but you can see the trend here they're gonna build this man up to be the man of steel. Anyway, I realize that this has been an incredibly long video for a dev diary. I heartily recommend you please, please go to the link down in the description below and read through all of this yourself. Go through the comments, see if there have been questions or answers. I haven't done that myself. I've been really busy. Like work is horrible right now, but this is an incredibly interesting look at the future of the Soviet Union in Hearts of Iron 4. This is a focus tree worthy of what is arguably the second most important country in the Second World War. I love the direction they're taking this DLC and not only that, what we've seen here is free. It's part of the free update, so you don't even have to pay to get all this good stuff. Anyway, if you liked the video, leave a like, consider subscribing and hit that bell icon to be notified whenever I upload more content. If you didn't like it, that's fine. Just hit that dislike button. Tell me what I did wrong. Always looking to learn. And this has been me, Bitter Steel. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.